boom there it is all right everybody welcome back it's another wonderful week out here in sunny san diego or in guelsh did i get that guelph, right? guelph guelph ah, got it. Yeah. Yeah. all right well anyway we're gonna have a lot of fun today talking about uh helping people living with stis let's destigmatize everybody let's have some fun here we go practicing polyamory real life perspectives from the imperfect people of polyamory the mission of the Practicing Polyamory podcast is to provide a platform for all of the real-life, flawed humans that practice polyamory so that we might all learn from one another and grow as a community. Enjoy the show. All right, here we go, here we go. Welcome, 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 everybody, one more time. Before we jump in and chat with today's awesome guest, I want to quickly remind everybody to please follow us on all social medias at Practicing Poly A. And if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever it is that you download your podcast, please subscribe and leave a review that's really going to help us show up higher on those search results. And but not a lot of good information. Loving this, having a good time. Uh, also, if you want to support the show, please send me a DM on whatever your favorite social media is. Ask me about your malpractice or errors in emissions insurance. I'm an insurance guy. I want to help you out. You're paying for it anyway. Why not buy it from somebody who's helping out the community, right? I guess. I don't know. Something like that. Help me out. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and as always, I want to remind you, if you're listening to this podcast, you are a welcome guest to be on this show. If you're actively polyamorous, polyam curious, or a professional serving the polyamorous community, we want to hear your story. If you are disabled, BIPOC, pan, bi, demi, gay, straight, sex worker, kinkster, le queer, lesbian, trans, NB, arrow, ace, whatever, we want to hear your story. The more stories we hear, the more the world learns about us. The more representation we have, the better we can serve our community. All right, that's my spiel. Now let's get to the good part and learn a little bit about our guest. Our guest today has a very impressive work history of working with marginalized communities. Having worked as an HIV support and transgender health clinic, her top priority is making sure that her clients feel safe to be and express themselves. She fully believes in the healing power of authenticity and how it helps us move in healthy and effective directions. By partnering with today's guest on your journey to self-actualization, you can rest assured that whether you're someone from a marginalized community or if you're just reticent to be vulnerable, her priority is to include you. She works diligently to ensure that every client, regardless of background, experience of marginaliz marginalization, or relationship structure, feels safe and comfortable to be vulnerable and authentic in your work together. Joining us today from Relationship Matters, Therapy Center in Ontario. Welcome to the show, Carling Mashinter. I know. I was got just your like, dancing shoes is on. It, is it professional to like pump it up right now? Because I'm yeah. feeling that. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we do. You, when you're on the Practicing Polyamory podcast, that's what we do. We pump up the energy. We pump up the volume. We have some fun and we talk about some really important stuff. You down with that? I think I can be down for that. Absolutely. All right. All right. <laughs> well, good. Welcome to the show, Carling. Thank you, first of all, for taking some time and hanging out with us today. Thank you for inviting me. This is, it's honestly an honor. That's one of our favorite words as therapists. It's an honor to be here because it's pretty rad to be invited to this. So thank you. Oh, well. I'm happy that you considered it an, an honor and not, you know, a pain in the butt because that's what most people <laughs> consider me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, the, there goes my brother, you know, making sure that he pokes a little fun just at like, me. Yeah. Yeah. Little jab, little jab. <laughs> but we do have some important stuff to talk about today, Carling, don't we? I mean, uh, when I was reading about you, when I was uh, doing my, my research, one of the first one of the things that stuck out to me was that you have worked with, uh, you know, people that are living with STIs. And yeah. I have, you know, been around the communities and enough mm -hmm. to know that this is definitely something that that we need to talk about, you know, um, in polyamory in ethical non-monogamy one of the things that we quote unquote pride ourselves in right is that we we're very um communicative we we talk very openly about a lot of different things and one of the things that we definitely bring to the table is our sti history and i know i see this on all of the facebook groups i see this you know everywhere somebody has you know hpv or even hiv or whatever all of these different uh you know stis might be and 
they find it so difficult to date. Mm -hmm. So let's start breaking down some of that stigma. Tell tell me about your work with that. Tell me about, you know, some of the things, some of the conversations that we need to be having. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So just to give you a bit of background, yeah, like you said, I've worked for a few years uh, with people living with HIV um, and in addition to some other STI diagnosis as well. And uh, it was th that was really um, what brought to me some experience of how almost insidious uh, STI stigma can be, mm -hmm. not only on our sense of self, but our relationships. So mm -hmm. I'm trained as a relational therapist and a sex therapist and just how STI, STI stigma um, brings people shame, like feelings like as if you're somehow a bad person because you're living with an STI, which, or you know, dirty. Oh yeah. Dirt. Oh God. That makes me cringe. Just thinking about how that's associated mm -hmm. with it or irresponsible. I mean, I think you and I can go on maybe for half an hour talking about all these really, I think, ridiculous, but negative associations um, for folks living with STIs. So I think it's really important that we each individually assess within ourselves, how much am I buying the stigma, right? How much am I participating in the stigma? How much am I believing in the stigma that someone who's living with an STI or, hey, if I'm living with an STI, that this is somehow means I'm what a bad or irresponsible person mm -hmm. let's think about that mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly the conversations that we need to be having um because when it comes right down to it a lot of people are very hesitant to get into a relationship with somebody who who has an sti who's living with an sti um why why shouldn't we be afraid why why should we be able to just say hey you have whatever it is, you know, whichever STI that, that, that you want to throw out there, pick one. Why should I say it doesn't matter? I can still be in a relationship with you. Mm, another great question. Yeah. So uh, sorry if you can hear background information. I have a puppy behind me. So, so oh. just sorry if you, um, if you're hearing that, but what, what comes, what comes up for me is, is the why is, well, okay. It's just because someone has, an STI doesn't mean that you're at high risk for getting it too, because some people are very nervous, uh, very maybe mm -hmm. even scared of contracting an STI, Absolutely. right? Uh, of course, there's discomfort, but I also think a primary reason is because of the H or sorry, the STI stigma, of course, HIV stigma included in that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I don't want to be vulnerable to having experienced the social, psychological almost ramifications mm -hmm. because of the way our culture believes in you know, what we believe in um associated to sti stigma right but but i think what what a conversation self-reflection practice should be well okay so someone i do have this fear and acknowledging that it's my fear if i'm the person mm -hmm. who has it what are some you know maybe risk reduction ways i can still connect with this person i want to connect with how can i have a sexual connection while reducing the risk if i'm very concerned about getting uh, contracting that sti because there's a heck of a lot of ways to keep yourself safer from contracting sti from a different person so here's an example too that i think many people don't know about is that we have progressed scientifically so much with our hiv treatment that many people on treatment get to a point where they can't transmit HIV to their sexual partners. What? Yeah. I wasn't aware that was something a person could do. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorites for this show. Um, but really, like, yes, to a point that they, they can't even contract it because that's definitely, you know, for for me, right? I, as far as I know, haven't dated anybody that is living with an STI. And I mean, I'm with you. I, I want to be, you know, on the front lines. I want to be battling against against the stigma. I want to be, you know, an ally in as many ways as I can and and helping to destigmatize. But, you know, I, I have those same concerns and I guess if, if that's the word, you know, like are, are, are I'm wondering if like they're valid concerns, but you're you're telling me like with HIV, it, it can get to a point that it can't even be transmitted. That's 
mind blowing to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's specifically HIV. What other, yeah. what other, um, STIs are people living with that are, that are being stigmatized and what else can we learn about and know about that's going to help us bring down that stigma? Yeah. I, yeah. I think, um, you know, something else to know is that some STIs like um, gonorrhea and chlamydia are actually treatable, you know, right. curable would be another word for that, um, through antibiotics. Now there is uh, some versions of, you know, for example, gonorrhea that can be resistant to antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And this would be a better conversation to, to talk to hopefully your good doctors about, right? Of like how to attend to that, because that's a gap in my knowledge. But that there is, there's a lot of um, cures available to some, to some STIs. And there's so many treatment methods for, you know, incurable STIs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for example, genital herpes. Um, okay. It's first, HPV, right? Uh, oh, no, that's a different. It's different. It's HCV. Um, okay. HPV is the human papilloma virus. Um, so it just a, a different. Sometimes it can be similar um, symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine that might you know some people might mix that up, um, but uh, it's a different virus. And so for genital herpes HCV, that so many people have it. Okay, and this is not to like scare people, but I'm trying to normalize that. Oral and genital herpes is really, really common, okay? Right. And there are ways that treatments that um, doctors can prescribe you to help it not feel as uncomfortable when you're having mm -hmm. a flare up. And to know that the, the transmittability of herpes, you can still, you know, when you're not having a flare up, you can still transmit it, but that it's like a, a reduced risk of transmitting it to another partner. And it might just mean, okay, different sexual practices to reduce the contact to contact risk of uh, getting herpes from someone who's living with herpes. Okay. And so what I really, I guess the core of it is take a curious approach to this. Don't make mm -hmm. assumptions about things you just don't know. This is like a great opportunity to really research, ask medical, medical practitioners you trust to give you insight. About what are the options to still have a great, hey, sexy connection with somebody who's living with an STI? Let's dismantle this idea that it's not sexy to be sexually connecting to someone living with an STI. Because it I sure as hell can be. Yes, there it is, right there. Uh, dismantle that idea. Oh, I, I I love it. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm looking for ways to be an ally to more people that are marginalized. And yeah. when somebody, I mean, you mentioned a little bit of it. There's there's like a, a societal mm -hmm. trauma. Right. Yes. When when you are diagnosed with some kind of an STI, even if it's a curable one, even if it's gonorrhea, chlamydia, you know, something that can go away in a week, you know, just, mm -hmm. you know, even even having that conversation with somebody like, oh, yeah, I got I got the clap, you know, yes. whatever. Like, I don't know if people still say that, but <laughs> I don't know. I haven't heard it in a while, but yeah. But, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that that even saying it, it's like. Oh, you know, oh, what yeah. were you doing? You know, um, yeah. but but it's it, it's all curable. And I guess I, I, I want to see if you can tell me uh, kind of express some of the some of the things that your clients or your patients have gone through when they are when they have that societal trauma, when they're, when they're going through it and they have this all in their head that they're being told that they're dirty or wrong or that they've done something nasty or whatever, you know, all these things that, that, that are going in their minds. What are some of the ways that they can come back from that? What are some of the things that they can do to, to recover and, you know, normalize it within themselves mm -hmm. so that we can have that fight and normalize it outside? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm really excited about about these p healing pieces. So, thinking about first societal uh, trauma, I got a lot of insight into what it was like because I'm only 30, right? So, I didn't really live through the AIDS crisis in the you know the 80s, 90s time period, but I mm -hmm. worked with a number of clients who did and were diagnosed during the AIDS crisis. Holy moly, guacamole, the stigma was real. Okay, it's still oh, yeah. real today, but very much so. Oh, words cannot describe what I've heard, what people were, had gone through, basically shunned, 
right? Mm-hmm. Some some experience. Mm-hmm. I won't go into too too many details about this to protect confidentiality, but just in general, just the shunning and uh, isolation that that yes. folks at that time and still even today sometimes experience mm-hmm. that you know, just a shifting and changing in how people view you if they find out about your diagnosis, okay? Yeah. And and that, here, here's one of my favorite pathways of healing. Let's address what's a you problem and what's a them problem. And the them mm-hmm. problem is society, maybe that crappy parent who disowned you, right? As an example, okay? Because often what happens because we're all under the influence of an STI stigma culture, is that we make it an us problem. Someone who is living with the STI, it's an us problem, meaning we're bad, we're gross, and we start believing this internally about ourselves. That needs to be healed. That's the that's a primary pathway of healing. Okay, and once we get through that, once we get almost like unwrapping the internalized STI stigma that we're feeling, so we create a better relationship with ourselves, then we suss out who deserves to be in our life. For those that are not willing to destigmatize SDIs mm-hmm. within themselves, they're not worth it to be in your life, in my opinion. And that sounds a little sassy. Sometimes I use a bit of sass in my therapy because <laughs> it can help, right? Yeah. More of like, no, I don't deserve this level of treatment. I have value. Correct. Thank you. Right? That's exactly it. And so really supporting clients and recognizing their value and making sure they're living in a way that aligns with who they are, not what mm-hmm. society or other people with STI stigma are telling them who they are. That can be really difficult to do though, especially when those relationships, those people that are not our allies are our parents, our yeah. you know close family members, friends that we've grown up with. I mean, when you, when you say it like that, it's, it's almost like, this person is going to have their whole lives swept out from under them and and almost like starting over. I I don't know if I, I I tend to believe that most cases aren't quite that extreme. Mm -hmm. Uh, There may be some people who will not be accepting and you know, that you need to cut out. Hopefully it's not people as close as parents and siblings and, you know, immediate family. Um, but certainly not to a point where where they have zero support system, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I've heard a range of experiences. Sometimes it is like everything's ripped from underneath that person, unfortunately. But there is so many people that still have sometimes just like a full circle of people around them or nothing's mm-hmm. really shifted too dramatically in their relationships um, related to a a diagnosis. Um, But I think another key piece that I really learned working in, uh, you know, the HIV support sector, community is everything. Okay. Mm. So what we, what we did, um, so I worked at HIV uh, resources and community health here in Guelph. And what we did there, we had social hour every Monday. Okay, where we had a you know a couple of hours where anyone, you know, who's living with HIV that that is associated with our clinic could come and just hang out. We'd have snacks. We just talk. It doesn't have to be HIV related, but just having that shared experience, mm-hmm. right? And knowing that you're not gonna you're not gonna come and like having to worry as much about STI stigma with the people that you're around, right? So, I think having really finding your community some some places some people that you feel safe that you don't have to have that ongoing worry or fear that is sti stigma is going to be present i think is key sometimes it can be challenging to find but at least those for those living with hiv the hiv support organizations are across ontario here in canada so anyone listening from that region can certainly reach out and look into that in their own region Mm -hmm. Community is so important, and I 100% agree with you that when we find ourselves in these situations, I mean, that this is what one wonderful thing that the internet has done for us is it's given us a sense of community, no matter no matter what we are, who we are, what we're into, you know, uh, us polyamorous folks, we have our communities, you know, um, and and anybody living with, with STIs, there's bound to be a relatively local you know i know some people live way out in the boonies two hours from anything um but you know there are communities communities do exist and even having the online connection can be um 
soothing, you know, it can be very, very helpful. Uh, now, kind of switching the conversation to polyamory, mm -hmm. right? So we have not only this STI stigma that we're dealing with, but now we have multiple people who are very important to us, right? Mm -hmm. And not everybody that we're dating is necessarily going to be an ally. So let's say that I'm in a situation where I'm getting to know this new person and this new person tells me about, you know, the fact that they're living with an STI. Of course, I need to disclose that to my partners, right? And they're going to disclose that to their partners, right? I mean, so 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 first of all, there's there's the difficulty in having that conversation at what point i mean how many partners 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 need to be made aware of this situation mm. oh that is such a it's a complex question to answer right yeah, I love it that, is again, right love that you ask these questions but you know so what comes to me is is for me first is the idea of disclosure and who's in control of what and with whom is disclosed and i'd like to thank the person who is living with the STI has the most control over what information about them and their health status is disclosed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, with that being said, it's, I think it needs to be a really open, transparent conversation with, you know, partners of just what's okay to share and what's not okay to share. And it depends, I think, on the STI and how much, I guess, uh, ability to prevent STI transmission ac ac across partnerships, right? So for, for example, um, some people are, are fluid bonded and so they're not exchanging fluids with anyone else, but say like three, the three partners, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're all fluid bonded. So then, you know, certain STIs where it's mainly um, transmitted through exchange of, of fluids and they're using condoms with or barriers with other people, maybe this, the status of, you know, the STI status isn't needed to be disclosed to the partners where they're using barriers, right? Mm -hmm. So that was just an example. I think it's, the reason it's complex to answer this question is that it depends on the configuration and the agreements and what uh, sort of safer sex practices that people are using, right? And so if, a, you know, if clients of mine were asking this, that's what I'd be exploring with them. <laughs> And ensuring that, you know, you are abiding by all of the boundaries and agreements within your partnerships. Does that make sense? Definitely makes sense. Okay. I mean, it's, it, it is a complex <laughs> question, but I mm -hmm. guess, you know, um, what I was kind of wondering is like the person who is living with the STI mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, they have rights to privacy and that's where I'm trying to figure out like, and, and I think that you explained it pretty well. If I have a partner, you know, I'm just using myself, you know, I'm getting to know somebody who's living with an STI. I have another partner uh, with whom I'm fluid bonded. Right. So I should probably tell at least, you know, my fluid bonded partners mm -hmm. and do I'm, I'm I'm like do they need to tell their fluid bonded partners mm -hmm. right or do they only need to make them aware if there's like a condom breaks or something along those lines mm -hmm. yeah I, I think it's it, it goes down to that transparent communication like this is my general response to any of these is make sure everyone is consenting right mm -hmm. to these conversations analyze the risks and benefits of each conversation, right? And who needs to know and who doesn't. It, again, it depends on the STI, right? So if someone is living with HIV and we, we use the term undetectable, meaning they get a blood test and their medications or their treatment's really good. You can't detect HIV in their blood. There's not wow. enough, right? Wow. It is, it's huge and powerful. And so if someone is undetectable and say they're using a condom, and then, you know, but they're not okay with you telling your partner, well, their partner that they're fluid bonded with, the, ri the risk is like zero. Okay. Really? Yes. If you're using condom and undetectable, guess what? Legally here in, in Canada, you don't even have to disclose your status to partners. What? Yep. So it's being up to date about what is the actual risk here, right? Mm -hmm. to, and is everyone consenting to this information getting disclosed? And to who? Wow. That's where I stand on that. 
Yes, I mean, it, it really, like everything else, it's all about communication. It's all about having that conversation and, you know, seeing seeing what people are comfortable with disclosing and what they're not. But I'm, I'm really like, so with condoms and undetect- undetectable, mm-hmm. the transmission rate is practically zero. Yep. Without the condoms, is it? I mean, it's pretty much it's pretty much zero as well. Um, but the the condom with the condom use is an extra layer of protection in the case because you have to take these medications each day. We actually have mm-hmm. transitioned into monthly shots, which is going to hear um, give me better for adherence. But let's wow. say I know it's it's wild, right? It's absolutely amazing. We're really progressing. I'm sure in our lifetime there will be a cure to HIV. Okay. Don't hold me to that, but I'm sure there will be. Okay, <laughs> I love Truly that. Believe I, I'm, that. I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm hopeful. I me like too. It. Me too. Right. And so, and so, it's really good to know these things. And our legal system is actually responding to that, right? That you can't be held legally. Like, if say somehow you know it was found out that you had sex with a condom and you're living with HIV, but also undetectable, you're not. You're not going to be legally bound to anything. That's okay. You don't have to disclose. That's, That's a big deal. That is a big deal. And that's that's a just wonderful, you know, wonderful news and, and you know, really lends to that idea of, of destigmatizing, especially living with with HIV. Yes. Um, is it necessary to get like a, an annual test to see if it becomes detectable or go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, the you do you do ongoing blood tests. I, I believe I, I might be misremembering, but I believe the clients I used to work with, because I was associated with a health clinic too, mm-hmm. um, would come every six months to test uh, their viral load. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So every six yeah. months you're checking in. And let me tell you this too. I'm really jazzed about this. There's a uh, prep, okay, which is um, pre-exposure to HIV. So you can take these medications uh, again once a day. And you are, your risk of getting HIV with someone who's like living with HIV is like zero because you're actually, it's almost like you're immune to it through these medications. Yeah. Like, so, a, like a vaccine almost? Per, yeah. You could, you could call it similar to that. It's, you know, a little bit different in that it's not going into your bloodstream and making like immunity forever. Right. You have to take the, you know, the pill a day. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, maybe they're transitioning into a shot a month. I'm not sure about that. Prep is huge for for many folks, especially if they are partnered with someone. That's what I was gonna say. Mm -hmm. That's exactly like that was the the light bulb that just went off in my head. Is is if I find myself in a relationship with somebody who's living with Mm -hmm. HIV, uh, then I can take prep and like, and they're taking their wow. Oh yeah. That's it. Yeah. Now <laughs> let me make let me make one complicating factor. It's like a thousand dollars a month. Let's hear it's, it. Let's hear it. It's expensive. It's like a thousand dollars a month. Oh, okay. holy crap! Ah, right. So there's some social services. Our disability uh, support program does cover that if you can access that. Uh, and mm-hmm. sometimes people's um, you know jobs allow for benefits for for medication and can cover that. But that's the complicated factors that certain classes mm. get access to this stuff. I know, don't you hate that, right? It's like, <sighs> that is, that is the uh, systemic, I would say oppressive situation related to this. Mm-hmm. Oh boy, that that that's gonna start a whole new tangent. <laughs> that's of... a different podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it kind of is. I mean, we only, you know, mm-hmm. I, I only told you thirty minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> I could go all day. <laughs> yeah. Wow, but I mean, this is this has been uh, very enlightening, uh, really cool. Um, as far as destigmatizing, you know people living with HIV. Um, and, well, HIV is what we've been talking about, but just STIs in general. Yes. Uh, what questions did I not ask? What did I miss? Hmm. Nothing's coming to mind. I think you highlighted a, a lot of great points and, and questions about the STI stigma and how to address that. And I love that you you pinpointed societal trauma because I think that's a huge piece to this. Oh, absolutely. Right? And I, I think just to add to that is is really, um, I guess, reinforced to th- this is just that uh, trauma brings shame for all of us. When we experience trauma, we feel shame, which is I am bad in some way, right? And I think that's the key element that really needs to be addressed and challenged within ourselves, that if we're 
you know, living with an STI or we know somebody, maybe we're partner with someone is like, are we feeling any degree of I am bad or they are bad related to this? And that's the key healing path that I think needs to be a priority here. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect, yeah. perfect, perfect. Carling, it has been such a pleasure to get to chat with you and get to know you and get to uh, fight the good fight with you here, uh, starting to to destigmatize STI, people living with STIs in our communities. Um, you know, for us polyamorous folks, that's, that's especially a conversation that we need to be having. Uh, and, you know, I encourage everybody listening to, you know, approach it curiously, like we mm -hmm. talked about. Um, destigmatize bring that you know there, there are treatments there are ways to reduce risk there's a lot of different things that, that are available for us to uh you know be kinder to yes those marginalized communities um carling before we go if anybody wants to work with you if anybody needs mm -hmm. wants to get in touch with you or uh you know talk to you in any way what is the best way and especially for our listening audience because a lot of people just listen on the podcast mm -hmm. and not watch the show what's mm -hmm. the best way for people to get to reach you yeah, the best way is to check out my website. It's uh, relationshipmatterstherapy.com. And there you can reach out. Uh, you can send us a little note and we get that in our in our inbox. Uh, what's also really cool is our Instagram is Relationship Matters Therapy. And on there, we have tons of posts that give you tips and tricks to enhance your relationships, including polyamorous and non-monogamous relationships. And of course, you can send us a DM on Relationship Matters Therapy on Insta. Very cool. Once again, Carling, thank you so much for spending time with me today uh, and for all this very valuable, very wonderful information. You, you're awesome, and I appreciate it. You are awesome as well. Thanks for having me. And thank you, as always, also to our live audience for tuning in today. As a reminder, when we're live, you get no commercial interruptions, but the same cannot be said for those podcast downloads, although I appreciate it. I get a penny every time you download. If you want to avoid the commercial interruptions, be sure to catch us live Monday through Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, or sign up for our Patreon where you get access to our commercial-free RSS feed and support the show. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, wherever it is that you download podcasts, and if you haven't already, please leave a review. Really, really appreciate it. Don't forget to follow on social Social at practicing polyA. Thank you again, Carly. Carling. <laughs> I said Carly. <laughs> Thank okay. you again, Carling. You're welcome. All Thank right, you. everybody. You all. Have a nice day. Thank you for tuning in to the Practicing Polyamory podcast. Would you or someone in your polycule like to be a guest? Sign up at practicingpolyamory.com and join the conversation. Please support us by subscribing, liking, and following us on social media at Practicing Polya by clicking any of the affiliate links on our website or by subscribing at patreon.com.